Okay, so I'll be brief. I'll just say welcome everyone. Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective and um, welcome to Aya Santatita, who's going to be our wonderful teacher um, today. I'm really glad to see everyone. And uh, and that, without further ado, that's all I have to say. <laughs> The the meeting is being recorded, but it's just Ayas and Tachito is being recorded, so none of your faces will show up, and it'll be uh, posted on YouTube along with our other um, videos. Okay, thank you, Noam. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm speaking to you this time from the Aloka Earthroom in San Rafael in Coastal Mivo Glens. And, uh, you know, this year I'm going to be with you another three times online, including today, because in December it falls on a day when, when Ayana Nabodi and I are already teaching the New Year's retreat. And uh, so it's three more times. And, and I thought, you know, I would like to use the theme of the four protective meditations. Not sure if you've heard about those. And one of them we already have done several times. So the remaining three and that just, you know, as usual, we're going to start with uh, the refugees and the precepts and then, you know, settling in shortly. And then I introduce us to the theme for the next three sessions and then start with the first sub theme today which is going to be Bhutan Sati, uh, reflection on the qualities of the Buddha. It's a very like, traditional, classic meditation. And that's I, I'm going to introduce it to you and bring it into contemporary times. OK, so uh, would you, Noam, like to screen share in the refugees and precepts? So I'm going to, you know, first start with chanting the Namo Tassa. And if you just, you know, keep yourself muted and you can join in in that. And then we do the um, refugees call and response and the precepts as well. And then maybe after the Namo Tassa, Noam, you can unmute yourself. So I can have you as a partner to do the call and response. Okay, everybody ready? Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Now, Nom, you can unmute yourself. Bhutang Sarananga Chami. Bhutam Sarananga Chami. Dhammang Sarananga Chami. Dhammang Sarananga Chami. Sankam saranam gachami. Sankam saranam gachami. Tutiampi putang saranam gachami. Tutiampi putang saranam gachami. Tutiampi tamang saranam gachami. Do tiampi damam saranam gachami. Do tiampi sankang saranam gachami. Do tiampi sangam saranam gachami. Do tiampi putang saranam gachami. Do tiampi budam saranam gachami. Tatiampi tamang sarananga chami. Tatiampi damam sarananga chami. Tatiampi sankang sarananga chami. 
Satyampi Sangam Saranam Gachami Ti Sarana Kamana Niti Thang And now please scroll a little bit more down, no? And then I'm going to read the precept and then afterwards you can uh, repeat after I have read it. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha sikha patani silena sukatinyanti silena boga sampata silena niputinyanti tasma silang visotaye sadhu 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 Thank you for taking the precept you know and giving the gift of fearlessness to the world. It's a great gift you know great medicine wonderful okay so it's lovely to see you all this afternoon and um, you just let's take a few minutes you know to arrive in the space zoom room the virtual meeting space Bringing, you know, our minds and our bodies together where you're sitting right now. And just really landing. Landing on the earth, you know, landing on the cushion and on the chair where you're sitting. And then, you know, knowing that that rests on the earth just underneath the house where we are in. And we can feel, you know, as the gravity is pulling us towards the earth. That's where our work is, you know, to integrate the practice with those earthy bodies of ours. And getting our hands dirty, you know, with the masses, which are there. We can't escape just into the mental realm. We need to always bring it back as long as we have a body. That can sometimes, you know, feel quite hard work. to really take an interest in embodiment. So today I wanted to introduce you to the so-called four protective meditations, you know, which are four different meditations we can find in the traditional suttas. And then like in about the fifth century, they have been put together into this list of four protective meditation in Sri Lanka. And they help us, you know, to develop the courage to meet the way things are, like all practices, you know, but they are particularly kind of a handy package because they um, relate to the two main aspects of the human 
you know, reincarnation, the, the human life, which is an opportunity for us to practice. And two of them, they show us the potential of a human life. That's the reflection on the qualities of the Buddha and metta meditation. They show us, you know, what a cultivated mind is or can be. And then the other two show us the limitation of the human life and the human body. And the first one is on the meditation on the body parts and on the elements, which we have done several times before, you know, show us that the body is, how vulnerable the body is, that the body isn't actually a separate entity, but in constant exchange with the planet. And the second one is the uh, meditation on death, Maranasati, which shows us, you know, that when the time comes, the body goes back to the elements completely. And then, you know, some new form of life arises out of that. So it shows us both sides, you know, and uh, on one hand, you know, it helps us to let go of our attachments and of our expectations of, you know, the human body and what it can and cannot do. And on the other hand, it, it shows us, it elevates the, the mind and allows us to let this mind open up and shows us the great potential of it. So it's, it's a very handy package, you know, to help us to be in balance and to get used to those possibilities. And so the first one on, on the, the list are the, is the recollection of the Buddha which uplifts the mind and gives us confidence because the Buddha was also a human being just like us and shows us what's possible, helps us to trust more in our own capacity, helps us to overcome fear. So that's the first one. And in this one, we're going to go more into detail today. The second one is the meta meditation, which you all know probably in some way or another. It's like an antidote to anger and ill will and fear generally and helps to open the mind, you know, and bring the mind back on track when it is contracted and helps us to embrace experience and embrace ourselves in that experience, like, you know, going through the fire, helping us to go through the fire. Then the next one is Asuba. A ah is negation and suba is beautiful, the not beautiful side of the body. Looking at that, you know, which means looking at the body parts. You know, if we would cut open the body and do like this, what we see isn't particularly beautiful, but it's also part of what it is, you know, to have a body. So helping us to get more into balance and, and meditation on the elements is also uh you know close related to that meditation and we have done that in the past where we saw you know how the body how vulnerable the body is and it needs food it needs drink it needs air it needs temperature all of that it needs f from the planet really from the biosphere and that we never cut the umbilical cord and what an amazing process that is And you know, the body is like a riding animal for consciousness. And when the time comes, you know, we, we need to give it back. Look after it very well. And when the time comes to give it back, we need to give it back. So it helps us, you know, to cultivate a more balanced expectation about embodied life and prepares us for what is to come. And then the recollection of death, you know, which is considered the cutting edge of impermanence meditation, which really prepares us for the vastness from which we emerge, you know. The, the mystery, you know, where do we come from? How does that, we are born from our mother's wombs, yeah, but how did all of that 
if you really think of it, it is it is very, very mysterious. And then we dissolve again and go back. And then something comes out again. And it's just it's a bit like in-breath and out-breath. And that, you know, brings us a sense of being more completely here because we we are looking at the whole picture and can bring you know fun enough can bring a sense of joy and a sense of of really belonging once we have you know dared to open the mind to this truth in the beginning it's more like no 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 that's too much you know but then once we get over that it, it shifts it's quite amazing you know like those walls we think we're gonna hit the wall and knock ourselves and then you go come to the wall and the wall just disappears you know and then continue keep going and then the next wall ah and then before you hit it it opens up again so that's you know how this works this is the cultivation of the mind and they are called protective meditations because they protect us from getting lost in our hopes and fears. And they are not like a talisman, you know, so that we have no longer any problems. But they help us to relate to our problems in a way which is growthful, in a way which is emergent and not, you know, repetitive, like compulsion repetition, you know, if we operate out of a traumatic pattern you know then it's always the same response and the same response and the same situations arising in our lives until we understand you know that we are playing a part in that and that's something you know which starts to become more clear through practicing as we are having the courage you know to to turn towards so they are providing tools for transformation and transform so-called obstacles in opportunities. Letting go of the old and letting come of the next season, you know, and then the next season and the next season until full liberation. It's a graduated path. And these practices, you know, usually we can either do them for like 10, 15 minutes at the beginning of our meditation session and then come back to our usual object, or we can do a whole session in that way. All four of them can be used like that. And today I'm going to speak about the first one, about Buddha Anusati. You know, which is usually not very much taught in the West because, you know, there's not so much uh, interest in Buddhist circles uh, for devotion. You know, it's, it's considered to be a little bit of a brainwash and, and the, the power isn't really recognized. But I think, you know, devotion comes really in handy once everything else has been exhausted, you know, once everything else hasn't worked and we are completely in a heap you know on the ground then devote then is when devotion really becomes accessible you know when the ego is like defeated you know and can no longer find a way then we can surrender and buddhanusati is a practice you know which encourages us to remember the capacities of the buddha and to also remember that we have potentially the same capacities if we are you know daring to develop them and you know it helps us to dissolve what stands in in the way to recognize that the refuge you know the Buddha, the true buddha is actually here inside of our capacity for awareness so in the beginning, you know, we start with projecting it out like onto the Buddha as a mirror of that capacity and someone, you know, who has found the path. And then through practicing his instructions, slowly but surely, you know, we lay it open, this own capacity in ourselves and develop more and more confidence that we actually do know the path. If we 
turn back here again and again and uh, so we are recognizing in ourselves the very Buddha in whom we take refuge and that's the essence of all practices you know in all the schools and that's what the function of a teacher would be you know to encourage us to trust in our own capacity and at the same time you know for some time being willing to take on the uh, projections you know and, and carry them and then feed them back you know at the appropriate time so it uplifts the heart and the mind and there's this thing yes you know i can do it i can do it i might stumble around a little you know but i actually can do it and that generates faith and devotion and joy as well you know and they're all important for developing the mind because joy makes space in the mind you know it bubbles up and, and makes space in the mind and then we can step back and see the context better you know that the buddha was also a human being just like me and he has realized the absolute you know so both he was just like one of us but he has realized the highest potential and having you know having both of that being clear about both of that and then maybe also you know re reflecting on the tremendous influence for good what the buddha had on this planet how many millions of people have benefited from his teaching you know since it started in iron age india 2500 plus years ago incredible you know that alone can blow your mind you know in an unbroken chain of transmission has come all the way you know from india to us today and they're still they're still available and they still work in the same way as they did then because the the essence of the teaching is timeless and the packaging you know needs to be adjusted according to culture and times but the essence is timeless and uh, so that that uh, budano sati which we are now gonna soon start doing you know helps us to imagine what it would be like to have a mind like the buddha just imagine that you know that vastness which has you know supported and helped millions of people over these 2500 plus years amazing absolutely amazing and you know for this practice we can usually you know we can use a buddha statue if you have one at home or we can just visualize at different stages and i'm talking us through you know we visualize the face of the buddha the eyes of the buddha and the feet the face stand for the purity the eyes for wisdom and the feet for compassion because he was walking you know 45 years all over india you know sometimes he knew that person over there is ready you know if i walk like 100 miles i'm gonna be able to help that person to open and then he would do that incredible compassion incredible compassion and that meditation you know is the the aim for the meditation is to uplift the mind and encourage a certain kind of joy and then that helps the mind to settle you know brings the mind into samadhi and uh, you know we can see that in the progression of what's called the seven factors of awakening you know where joy is one of them and then after the mind becomes joyful it usually settles down becomes calm and when the mind is calm it collects and settles that samadhi and that then gives the mind a uh, kind of equanimity and stability upeka so and you know the uh, buddhano sadhita that meditation is 
uses like a certain chanting text we find in the in the in the chanting which we do here at, at the, the monasteries and also did them in England and it lists the nine qualities of the Buddha and I'm just gonna shortly do that chant now it's very short and then I go over the nine qualities to just that you have an understanding of them and then after that we just choose three qualities the ones I said before, you know, like the purity, the wisdom and the compassion. And we use that then as a mantra to settle the mind in meditation. Okay, so I'm just going to do the chant now. And the chant is called Itipiso. And Itipiso means so he is. And it describes the Buddha. Idipiso Bhagavara Hang Samma Samputo Vicha Charana Sampano Sukato Loka Vitu Anuttaro Purisatamma Sarati Sata Deva Manusana Puto Bhagavati Okay. So that was the chant. And now I'm just going to go over it. And those nine qualities, they are, you know, they are kind of inter, they are kind of divided, let's say, into five internal qualities and four external qualities of the Buddha. So the internal qualities make the Buddha like a reliable teacher. The first one is Arahang, and that means, you know, complete purity. He has completely eliminated all greed, hatred, and delusion from his mind, never to arise again. That's Arahang. And because of that, you know, he's liberated from samsara. Then the next one is Samma Sambuto, which means perfectly enlightened one, you know, who fully awakened without a teacher. He found the way by himself and he understands all Dhammas and he is able to teach them. That is complete wisdom. The next one is Vicha Charana Sampano and that means perfect knowledge and understanding and perfect conduct and ethics. So he's a master of both. And then Sugato means he has gone all the way along the Noble Eightfold Path. It means well gone. He's gone all the way and reached the goal of Nirvana or Nibbana. And the next one is Loka Vidu, which means knower of the worlds. He fully understands, you know, all of the realms, you know, not only the human realm, but also the other realms from heavenly realms down to hell realms. And he also understands all of the inner realms, you know, the five aggregates and uh, the five khandas and also the six sense spaces. So he understands all of the worlds and how they are conditioned. So that were the first five internal qualities which makes the Buddha a reliable teacher and then the external qualities it's about how the Buddha interacts with others how he can teach and guide them first one is Anuttaro Purisatamma Sarati which means unsurpassed teacher and trainer of people who want to be trained that he understands you know everyone's capacity and he knows the disposition and attitudes and he knows exactly you know how to pinpoint the teaching that's his great strength you know that's why he can guide people and the next one is sata deva manusanang which means teacher of beings in the heavenly realms the devas and also the humans next one is buto which means awakened one and also is also an awakener of others. He's awakened and he also is an awakener. And in the scriptures, actually, the word Buddha is not used a lot. But in the scriptures, the following word is used a lot, Bhagawa. 
and also still today in India, you know, enlightened beings are uh, addressed as Bhagavan. And in in the in the suttas, the Buddha is most often addressed in that way, Bhagavan. And Bhagavan means blessed one or exalted one. And you know, that means that he has fulfilled all of the other qualities, all of the other eight qualities we just went over before, he fulfilled them out of his great compassion. That was his motivation, you know, over countless lifetimes. And then even once he had realized full awakening, he was still walking for 45 years, you know, with his bare feet all over India to teach people. So that was his deep motivation which kept him going, you know, until he passed away then. And we are still benefiting from the teaching. It still rolls on the Dhamma. It's amazing. So I think, you know, that is it. You know, that are those nine qualities. And then we're going to just use three of them. Arahang, complete purity. Samma, Samputo, complete wisdom. And then Bhagava, complete compassion. And we use that, you know, to turn it over and over in the mind and combine it with a little visualization. And that gives the mind something to do. And if the mind has something to do, it settles down. So that was the, you know, the instructions. And now before we go into the meditation, I'm just wondering if any one of you has a question or a comment before we get started, please. Uh, you know, you can raise your physical hand or your Zoom hand. Oh, Victoria. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm still a little bit confused about um, because we always say the Buddha said this and the Buddha said that and um, and then you were just saying that Bhagavan is the term usually used um, for him yes. and um, insofar as Buddha means the enlightened or awakened one um, but but people talk about becoming a bodhisattva not becoming a Buddha I, I don't know it just seems like all the terms are mixed up in in our Western traditional mm -hmm. at least at least where i've studied so i just wondered if you could sort of sort of tease them out the different yeah. terms yeah i'm happy to do that you know in you know basically there is is two different actually there's you know in the theravada there is three paths one path is the path of the buddha you know which is like a fully enlightened one like gautama buddha that last buddha he was fully enlightened and, and he was also a very excellent teacher and then you know there is also Pacheka Buddhas this is a second kind of Buddha and they are fully enlightened but they they don't teach they don't have the gift of teaching and then there is the third one which is the Arahant you know this is uh, those who follow the Buddha's path but who have not found the path by themselves but they're following a buddha and then you know there is also the possible before if somebody is on the buddha path then he's a bodhisattva and if somebody is on the arahant path then they are you know they are called sakers in training so there's you know roughly speaking it's assumed you know that in the theravada tradition even there is also the Bodhisattva path is available, but many people in the Theravada school are walking the path of Arahant, you know, Arahantship, which is freeing their minds and hearts from greed, hatred, and delusion. And, and if someone is on the Buddha path, they do that as well. But on top of that, they also perfecting all of the parameters, the 10 parameters. But on the Arahant path, those, they are not perfecting the 10 parameters. But still, you know, realizing enlightenment, which means they don't come back to another body. 
And the thing is, you know, in the end of the day, that's all written down knowledge, you know, where I can't really guarantee that this is true. But this is what I understand it to be. And so it's basically you know, if you want to, is there's the possibility to step out of samsara, you know, of the round of rebirth by purifying the mind completely from greed, hatred, and delusion. And the other possibility is to do that, but on top of it, to perfect the 10 parameters and stay, you know, keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back until the mind has been totally perfected. That's, I would, I would kind of, you know, uh, explain it like that. And then they, those two ways of looking at practice, since hundreds of years, they are a little bit fighting with each other and saying, you know, I'm, that's the better one. And the other one, no, you know, but they're both, they both work, you know. So is it a choice that we make uh, when we're practicing? Yes. It's a choice. Um, it's a choice that we can make, you know, that's when, when people take the bodhisattva vows, you know, and then they say, I want to be practicing for Buddhahood. This is people who take the bodhisattva vows. You know, and other people, they don't take the bodhisattva vows, but they are still practicing. They're practicing for arahantship. Mm -hmm. And and they are both valid paths. You know what I mean? And And they are often... You know, it's like, you know, it's like in a dualistic world where we are exist with dualistic language and dualistic thinking, you know, everything always has an opposite, you know. So it's not like that there can't be just one thing because you, there, there's it was always one thing in in relationship to another thing, you know what I mean? So but it has been going on for over the centuries, you know, that there were discussions about which one is better. And of course, the people who do one think that one is better and the other one think that this one is better. So, you know, you have to then you find what, what you feel called to do. And that's what you do. This is the path you walk, you know. So would it be fair to say that the the path of the Buddha is um, or, or maybe the other way around the arahant path is eliminating greed hatred and delusion so it's purifying the mind and the buddha path goes one step further to cultivate and perfect the paramitas so it's like yes so yes. one is like one is like getting rid of the defilements and the other is adding virtues cultivating virtues the paramitas to 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 achieve perfection yes yeah, yeah. I think okay. that's how we can how we can see it, you know. Okay, that helps yeah. a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. No. Um, I think the second to last quality, one of the external qualities of the Buddha, I forget what it was called or how you exactly described it, but it seemed related to uh, to upaya, to skillful means, to being to knowing what a yeah. person needs in terms of, you know, and I and I loved what you said that I'd never heard that that the Buddha is like, oh, there's some dude. <laughs> Hundred miles away, who's ready? I'm going to go to him. Yeah, so it's yeah, really you know, knowing who's ready and then knowing how to reach them, right? Yeah, yeah. And that is mentioned in in some of the suttas, you know, that he would know, and then he would go there, you know, he would like walk really far, mm -hmm. and then would make sure, you know, that that person had something to eat because they can only really take it in if they're not completely hungry, you know. And then, yeah, amazing. Mm -hmm. So he could. There's, it's often written in the suttas, you know, he would wake up in the morning and then he surveys the, the world system or something like that, you know, and then he, he, he surveys it and then he knows that, you know, that kind of cow herd, you know, over there in that village, he's ready. And then he would go there. Yeah. And that's part of Upaya, right? That's part of 
That's so compassion, you know, that his great compassion and also his, this what's called here, Anuttaro Purisa Dhamma Sarati, unsurpassed teacher and trainer of people who want to be trained. And he understands their capacity, disposition and attitudes. And that's why he knows how to, how to catch them, you know. Okay. There's this beautiful example, you know, that it's called, I think, the simile of the cloth. You know, there was one monk who, who had like very low self-confidence that he can't, you know, he can't do any memorizing, he can't do any learning. And then the Buddha said, just take that cloth and rub it, you know, and he rubs it like long, 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 and he gets dirty, you know, and then he has a, has an insight into impermanence. Mm -hmm. Before it was white, you know, and then it got black through, through the over time, you know, and, and that taught him in a very simple way about impermanence. And that's what that person needed. And then he had a breakthrough. So it doesn't, you know, and for some people, they need a very complex teaching and then they have a breakthrough and, and everything in between. And he could, with his intuition, you know, he knew how to do it for them like kick them in the right way, you know, and then ding, you know. And there's sometimes those stories in the Vajrayana, you know, like where somebody got slapped over the head with a sandal or something and woke up, you know. I think this is Naropa and Dampopa or something like that. Yeah. Slapped him in the on the head and he woke up. <laughs> yeah. So I won't slap anyone on the head. I'm just going to share meditation with you <laughs> because I can't reach you on the screen. <laughs> okay. Any any other little comment or remarks? <sighs> okay. So let's just uh, get started. And then we have at the end, we have a few minutes again, you know, if we want to clarify something. So as always, you know, you don't have to work hard, just trying to really be here and attending to what's being shared and then allowing your heart and your mind to respond. Then allowing your breath to guide you into your body. Being conscious of the weight, earth, earth on earth. And you know, the Buddha is on record for in the night of his awakening, he was you know, assaulted by what's called like the different negative mind states, you know, the uh, Maras and, you know, all of the different horror stories were going through his mind and he touched the earth. And we can see today there's Buddha statues with the, with the earth touching mudra. He was touching the earth. And was asking the earth, you know, to be his witness that he has done his work. That he has engaged. And he has learned from that engagement. And at one point, you know, the learning is perfected.
And then, you know, we can now, you know, use this mantra as a springboard for the mind to open up and feel a sense of confidence and joy in its own capacity to open. And then, you know, we can, if you like, you can, if you have a Buddha statue in front of you, you could look at that statue. That's one way how we can do it. Or we can bring up an image and the word arahang, complete purity and seeing the purity in the Buddha's face. Samma Samputo, complete wisdom seeing the confidence in his eyes that he knows that, that he knows. And then Bhagawa, his feet, you know, which carried him through India for 45 years to teach and out of compassion, complete compassion. And then again, Arahang, complete wisdom, seeing his face. Samma Samputo, complete wisdom, seeing the confidence in his eyes. <clears throat> Bhagava, complete compassion. The feet who carried him 45 years around to teach. Arahang, complete purity. Samma, Samputo, complete wisdom. Bhagawa, complete compassion. Arahang, complete purity. Samma, Samputo. Complete wisdom. Bhagawa, complete compassion. Arahang, complete purity. Samma Samputo, complete wisdom. Bhagawa, complete compassion. And then just you know, seeing as the mind settles through the mantra. Can you notice, you know, that the mind is opening up? As the mat settles, you know, the mind becomes more clear. It's more available. Not, you know, contracted around story. Arahang, complete purity. Samma, 
some uh, some good to complete wisdom. Bhagawa, complete compassion. Arahang, complete purity. Samma Sambuto, complete wisdom. Bhagawa, complete compassion. You know, so not becoming aware of the quality of the mind as it is opening more and, you know, not contracting around anything. Subtle joy of an open mind. And, you know, being aware of the spaciousness. You know, listening into that spaciousness. Um, kind of tending to the space, you know, which is not ending at the walls of the room. Just limitless space. And then anything any phenomena which arise moving through the space, like clouds through the sky, 
sounds. Thoughts. Just letting them be.
and then you know dropping the spaciousness and becoming aware of that which is aware of the spaciousness which is also limitless like just allowing the mind to respond it's almost like making a u-turn And when you notice, you know, your mind wanders off into thinking about something, just noticing what's the state of mind. Letting go, like, you know, letting go of the cloud and recognizing the capacity of the sky or the mirror to reflect what is there.
being the knowing rather than becoming what is known. That's the difference. That's the crucial difference. Being, not becoming. You know, as we are coming slowly to the end of the meditation, just coming back to the body breathing.
of the embodiment, impermanence, changingness. You're feeling again the ground, you know, under the body. And there's this body and the soil underneath are the same. There's no real boundary between them, it just appears to be. When the mind is clear, it can much easier sense that non-separation. When it doesn't no longer, you know, scramble for some kind of a meaning, but it is just aware of sensefulness rather than meaningfulness. by sensing that non-separation, being part of something so much vaster 
which the mind of a Buddha has fully seen and can abide in that or as that. So thank you for coming today and we still have a few minutes if anyone would like to share something or clarify something. Victoria. We can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. I was I was uh, muted. Okay. Um, no. If 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 no one else has any questions, I still I still feel um, confused. <laughs> yeah. About the um, the arahant versus the buddha in the sense that um it seems wouldn't we want it all i mean <laughs> that's sounds... no i think there's different you know there's different i mean you know there's different uh viewpoints what all is you know for some all means to just completely step out as fast as possible you know out, out of the round of rebirth and just, you know, have the ego just be completely let go and go out. You know, it's compared with a candle, you know, where all of the fuel has been burned. And then the, the candle just goes out and, and the flame is finished. Yeah, because there's no more fuel in terms of greed, hatred and delusion. That's one way of looking at it. You know, it's two ways of looking at, at reality. And, and because we are living in a dualistic world, you know, be thinking in terms of big and small, you can only know what big is in, in relationship to something small, right? And you can only know what, what empty is in relationship to full and what is young in relationship to old. So the way how our minds operate, how we communicate, how we think is built on that way of thinking. So if you are having one path, there needs to be necessarily an opposite. Otherwise, we couldn't communicate about it. And there's two different ways how you can say to have it all, either by just completely letting go of everything and disappearing into whatever you want to call it. The Buddha didn't call it anything. Or you can just be on the Buddha path and completely... You know, I can't really exactly say it, you know what I mean? Because this it comes to the edge of what can be spoken about, you know. And this is why we have a million Buddhist books and so many lineages and schools, because everyone experiences it slightly different. There can there's still those two main schools, you know, what they call the Theravada, maybe, and the Mahayana in the olden times, it was called like that. These days, you know, one says that's not a good way of describing it. But it's this is the very product of trying to speak about it. You end always up with two options, you know. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, yeah. then, and then you have to just leave it at that. 
But one thing, you know, what I find great is to not forget that the Buddha always spoke about the middle way, you know, the one way how he would uh, describe his teaching, it says, is the middle path, you know. It's the middle path between the two extremes. And in a way, you know, I almost think those two paths are, in a way, the two extremes, you know. Mm -hmm. And because there is so much tradition behind all of it, you know, you don't want to go and mix up all of the, you know, and you know what I mean? So that's that's the inheritance is is this, you know, and then you go and you run with it. Yeah, find out for yourself. Because once you have really mastered it, you will know. And there's a beautiful book actually by Joseph Goldstein, which is called One Dharma. And it speaks about that, you know, because when he was, he started practicing in the um, um, Burmese tradition, you know, which was all very kind of, very defined, very kind of, you know, more like what would be called like a narrow path, you know, and then he made, and he had very good success with that practice. And then many years later, he made a Sokchen master, you know, who is was all about like vastness, you know. And then he got confused. So what's the way? What's the way? You know, I need to decide for one way. But you can go both. You know, you can go both. And, and then you see what works better for you at a certain time of your life. You know. So I, when, when you choose a, um, like, like you have chosen the, the ordained path, I mean, if you're, um, then do you feel like for if if you choose that path, then then you need to um, be faithful to one specific tradition, or can you still bring in other? I think you know it is very important to get a real understanding in one tradition to get really, you know, that you really understand that very well, and then I think one can take in and study and practice other paths as well. You know, and then learn through that more about one's own path, even, you know. So I was like practicing, you know, with the Thai forest tradition for 14 years. And then I met my Tibetan teacher, you know. And then I was practicing also Tibetan Sokchen practice, you know, for for many years. And then in the end, it it just kind of became one, you know what is sometimes called the ekayana, you know, the one yana that in the ek, actually one, you know, the Buddhist teaching, the Buddha didn't even teach Buddhism, you know, there was no Buddhism when the Buddha was teaching, but it becomes that, you know, as tradition goes on and things are handed down, written down, and then people need support, and then they say, come to me, don't go to them, you know, and then all of those things start because we are human beings and that's how it is in samsara. But do not take it too seriously, you know, but take it as a, as a signpost, you know, and then not get stuck on the signpost because that is kind of, that's not the point. You know, the sign is pointing, the finger pointing to the moon, not look at the finger, look at the moon, you know. So take the pointers from, from different schools and then you'll, at one point, you know, that falls away, those questions. But not necessarily by being answered, but they 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 don't have meaning anymore. You know, and and there will be one path which speaks to your heart more than another. Go for that, you know. Don't constantly change, you know, because this one is a bit uncomfortable. Now I'm gonna go somewhere else, you know. It's gonna be comfortable, uncomfortable the practice, you know, because it's about the ego getting grilled, more or less, you know. So but still, you know, have one path where you really know the lay of the land and then take in some other, you know, information and see. And then sometimes you might leave one behind and do another one, you know. But in the essence, you know, the essence of the Buddhist teaching on, in all three schools is the same. It's about letting go. And it's about realizing that the very Buddha you take refuge in is here and not not out there you know and it's different ways of like when you go and you eat spaghetti or you eat like uh, i don't know chinese food or korean it's all different ways of cooking cooking it up you know 
and I, I might not, you know, some people might not like it, but that is different ways of cooking it up and laying it all out, you know, but you need to eat and taste which one is good for you, you know, because that's so important. And when I went on once said that so clearly to me and I really, that helped me so much. He was saying, you know, there is not one path, one right path, but there's the right path for you, the right path for me, the right path for Noam, you know. And in the beginning, you know, we are always thinking there must be just one right thing, you know. But that's like, you know, when we are children, we think it all is black and white, you know. And then as we grow up, we see, oh my gosh, there's so much gray. <laughs> there's so much gray out there. And the more we can tolerate the gray, you know, the more mature we are, I suppose, you know. Okay. Yeah. I have learned it also the hard way, you know, <laughs> but getting so confused and thinking I must, I must kind of nail it down somewhere, you know, but that's the ego actually, you know, that's the ego. Yeah. Okay. Lovely to see you all. See you again next month. Bye. Bye now. Thank you for the beautiful teaching.